Welcome back to another great edition of the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. I am your host, Chris Brown, and we are talking the road to 2023 today. Our last Wednesday episode of the month where we talk Alberta politics. We bring in a commentator from uh, the past, from the future, and we talk Alberta politics, where the parties need to go, what the parties are doing, and what is going to happen over the next year before the 2023 election, if it's called in 2023. And today's guest, you may remember her from the live uh, Fort McMurray Lac La Biche, uh, special election special that we had here on the show. Sarah Biggs, the partner at Olson and Biggs, a PR firm here in Calgary. Sarah, honor and pleasure as always to have you on the show. Thanks for having me. How are you? Not bad. Thanks for asking. It is uh, been uh, a weird week <laughs> and it's only a week since the last time we talked since the Fort McMurray Lac La Biche by-election. Let's- I feel like it's been a month. <sighs> I know, <laughs> really? Um, let's start with the aftermath because we haven't talked about it on the show, but you and I are gonna digest. So you and I basically thought this was gonna go a different way. We thought Gene wasn't going to get the commanding majority that he did with 60, I think 6% or 65% of the final total. Unverified 66%. Unverified 66%. Well, so, 25th and 26 this week. Okay, so what what are your thoughts on the, well, let's let's get back to the, like, are you still shocked? Are you still shocked that Gene took it by so much? Are you surprised? Are you impressed? No, none of the above. It's Fort McMurray. It's, it had to be expected. There was a lot also, like we said last week, it was a little bit kind of like the anti-Kenny referendum if you wanted to, you know, frame it into whatever that thing was. Um, but I feel like it was a big wet firework. It did not take off. It, I'm going to explain. It's, ex I honestly thought that Mr. Gene had it in him, was going to come on guns blazing on Wednesday morning and just really starting to um, get to work. And it didn't happen. Where, where is he? He said last week he would have, you know, got Miss Notley. Uh, and the cabinet table if you know during the COVID that's how you would have managed it a lot of people let their hair on fire a lot um, of conservative MLAs let their hair on fire <laughs> I think he hurt himself a little bit to be honest um I I can understand the well-meaning and the adult thing to do into this statement because you know it's the right thing to do you want to make sure you know during a pandemic during big crisis like that you want to make sure that all of the elected represents all of the electorate has a voice at the table um which i believe is extremely important for cooperation there was a time back in the day where we would meet in the basement of the darcy maggie and discuss policy and try to deal with some stuff those days are long gone now. Nobody goes for beers anymore with anyone. It's very, uh, you know, each to their own. There's not as much cooperation, I would say now. Um, and a lot of people that they're, it didn't take off. It didn't take off for Mr. Gene and it's extremely disappointing. Well, he came out of the gate full guns of blazing. Uh, if you watched his uh, interview with CTV up in Fort McMurray, the moment the election was called, he said yeah. that he was basically turning his sights from Fort McMurray to Jason Kenney, and he asked the premier to resign. And he has basically, he like drove down to Edmonton the morning Ooh. after to be introduced in the legislature. So mm -hmm. he has been making the rounds on social, uh, on the news outlets and the uh sort of online shows the western standard had them ryan jesperson had them um are the are the battle lines drawn in the sand now for this upcoming leadership race or is gene going out now because he has nothing to do between now and when he gets sworn in so he basically is an mla elect and he's just going to tour the province and get shore up support for this leadership review isn't he yeah yes i 
The social media has been um, pretty quiet for the past few days, lots of retweets, not a lot of bold statements or things that should, you know, um, not really express anything in regards to um, the rule change, the rules changes with, um, because now the ACP has 14,000 people that has registered to vote for this leadership review. He retweeted Mr. Bratt. And that's pretty much the extent of it. I think maybe perhaps he's waiting for party um, to issue the new rules. We know for a fact that they're gonna be located in Edmonton, Red Deer and Calgary. Um, I would hope for his own sake um, that, you know, Mr. Jane would be working the room right now and really trying to get as much support as he can. Um, but I don't know, it's been pretty quiet. He's been, it's been pretty quiet. A little too quiet. I, I, I'll agree that I, I really have, I follow, I follow him on social media, but I haven't seen much from him lately especially in the last probably weekend and even uh, at, before we were recording this, there hasn't been much from him. What I, I, I want to just take a moment here and I get your reaction on the Peter McKay tweet that uh, Peter McKay, former Minister of National Defense, uh, ran for the uh, Conservative Party leadership in 2020. Jason Kenney mm -hmm. endorsed Aaron O'Toole. Peter McKay came out and said, congratulations, Brian Jean, kind of a weird statement for a former conservative leadership candidate, former MP to sort of talk about a random by-election win. He didn't say anything about the Athabasca by-election win. Was this yeah, a subtle well, shot at Jason no, Kenney from Peter McKay? I don't think so. We need to remember that Mr. Jean and Mr. McKay were, were in the conservative party on the Hills and they were colleagues for a while until uh, Mr. K um, Jean decided to leave. Um, so I think he was just trying to be nice. Um, I don't think there's much to see into it. Mr. McKay has, I strongly believe that Mr. McKay has no intention of meddling into the mess that is Alberta politics right now. He's comfy in Nova Scotia. He's happy over there. Um, the fact that he announced that he was not going to run is not surprising to me at all. Um, I think the last election was a little better for him, but no, I think it's just a colleague congratulating a colleague and that's it. No, maybe it's, like, yeah. I, I might be thinking, I might be looking way too much in. And again, I've got my blinders on of everything that's going on has to have some type of angle to it. Yeah. And I guess that is not the case when it comes to Peter McKay. Uh, maybe, but, maybe it could be wrong. Hey. But there's been weirder things that happen in politics these days <laughs> we yeah. we are heading into the sort of the last week of the leadership review next not this coming weekend but the following one if i'm not mistaken mm. or the one after that i apologize in two weeks time so we have 14 days just over 14 days until the leadership review account on april 9th yeah. Jason Kenney's out in full force. He's making it known that he wants a united conservative uh, party. He is getting his MLAs to wear buttons. If you've been watching some of the social media feeds of people making comment that the MLAs are standing behind Mr. Kenney. What does Kenney need to do between now and the ninth to shore up support and make sure he does get that 50% plus one to win? Honestly, I think we're going to be a 95 Quebec random kind of situation, a 49.7 versus a 50.3. Um, you know, I did some math this weekend before the rules were changing. I was not giving Mr. Kenny higher than 35%. Um, now with the rule change, well, the potential rule change, the non-official rule change, uh, I think we would be getting a little bit closer from 50%. But I think really... At the end of the day, we need to remember that the MLAs, it's their job, it's their income. It's nobody wants to go there, especially in current political climate where everything is so acerbic and so incredibly polarized to put themselves out there and just be like, you know what, let's do this and be confident you're gonna be winning with, the, with a majority. Um, does he have confidence of the caucus? I'm not convinced. 
I think that a threat of a snap is a pretty effective way to whip your caucus. While there's been no mention of a snap election, um, no. there has been murmurs of a snap election. Yes. 50% plus one, if it is that 95 referendum that you talked about, that is a very weak leadership uh, mandate to run a leadership on yeah. or to run in an election. If he doesn't get above a certain percent, does he have to hold off until May next year? Or does he sort of play the yeah. cards and see where the chips fall? Because we saw the Janet Brown poll come out recently. It says they're in majority. Well, we don't know how that poll yeah. was leaked, but. Well, that poll, well, we kind of have an idea and, you know, some comments from Ms. Brown came out today and also the uh, Canadian Pollster Association or something the likes. Um, she was, she said she was pressured by the current government to release the numbers. And so what do we need to remember? Janice Brown is one of the best pollsters in this province. And I really honestly think that she is. Um, but also when the poll was conducted within the timeframes we were given, Mr. Kenny benefited of a, I call it a budget blip. It's a little boost, you know? So we need to take that in consideration as well. I don't think we need to write it off and be like, oh yeah, Kenny's gonna win it tomorrow morning, no problem. I, do, I would be extremely imprudent to do so. I think that the NDP is still in a good position. They just need to keep working hard and harder. So we'll, we'll talk about the NDP here in a few seconds, but yeah. I want to go back to that leadership race that we're potentially, yeah. well, leadership review. I shouldn't say race because we're not sure where the chips are falling. 14,000 people are potentially registered. We don't have the official numbers. This is what uh, people are speculating and the UCP are telling us. We don't yeah. have the official numbers that the, the, this is going to be true. Like I take it at face value. 14,000 members going to be descending upon Red Deer if they do not change the rules. This big of a turnout is very rare in politics to see 14,000 people come out to vote for a political party in a leadership review. Does yeah. this spell trouble or is this a better yeah. chance for, is this Kenny able to shore up his support and sell those memberships that he needs to? It's gonna be interesting to see how you work. Oh, I hate calling it the ethnic vote, but um, the vote from, different communities um, in Calgary and in Edmonton, where he knows we know that he is extremely popular uh, within different communities, the Filipino community, the Chinese community, um, the Sikh and um, the Punjab community is extremely popular as well. Um, you know, his nickname, the federal level was Minister Hurry in the Curry, Curry in the Hurry, um, because he was just all over the place on time. Um, I would like to believe that this calls for trouble for Mr. Kenny. But so we need to remember back in 2017 for the PC vote, they had 1,460 people voting. Now it's 10 times that. Um, Mr. Kenny won with a crushing majority in 2017. Then after that, there was the UCP leadership election 2017. We need to remember that we are still dealing with some RCMP uh, investigation still pending, not resolved. It's been five years now and you know, it's not out of the woods. A lot of, um, there's a few MLAs, especially one um, Mr. Gottfried, Richard Gottfried from Calgary Fish Creek has been extremely vocal in the past few days expressing concerns. Mr. Lowen wrote a letter to the RCMP being like, can you please keep an eye out for us? Because we, we think that something might be fudged. We're worried about the integrity of this election. Um, this weekend, I, I wrote a tweet saying that I would strongly recommend the party to hire a third party um, auditor to supervise the count and the electoral process. And apparently it has been rejected by the board. So 
why wouldn't you want an auditor to overlook this? Because you want this to be up and up. You want this to be on the uh, the complete ups. And the and I, the party might say we have uh, we have uh, trust in the people who are going to be conducting this uh, election, mm -hmm. but history is always doomed to repeat itself if you forget it. So, my friend, it, it's in the province of the personal responsibilities. We should be fine, right? Totally. Nothing ever bad happens when you have responsibility. <laughs> it's going to be interesting to see how everything plays out for sure. Um, but I don't have my money on either Kenny's going to lose it or Kenny's going to win it. I I don't know. Um, I really Do you see a scenario where, and this this is the complete hypothetical here, and this is what this is why I bring you in because I, I think of these things myself, and I want to have I want to bounce back and forth with people. But do you see a scenario where Jason Kenny wins this? Uh, Jason Kenny keeps his leadership. He gets 60, 70 percent, whatever that number may be, mm. and or 50, 55 percent, like Ralph Klein did back in two thousand four or five, whenever he decided to step down. Um, and Brian Jean saying, well, I tried, I'm leaving, I'm going across the aisle to sit as an independent, or do you think he stays with the UCP? The right thing to do would be gathering support for Mr. Jean and cross the aisle and do some damage to the UCP. That would be the right thing to do on Mr. Jean's part. Now, could Mr. Kenny decide to call a snap in October and June and July? Everything is still possible. Everything is still on the table. Um, you know, I really, really hope that um, there's a sixth wave coming our way. I really hope for the sake of Mr. Kenny that this one will not be as devastating as the other ones because he will be, that's the thing. There's no, with, Mr. Kenny is in the corner right now and he's in a position whether he makes good decision towards um, any COVID uh, mandates or either he makes bad decisions, both sides will be upset. So when he makes reasonable decision like not lifting the mask mandate or reintegrating the mask mandate in class, uh, the right's going to get upset the more, you know, libertarian and, you know, make do your own research. Um, Mr. Um, Ho Hoven, Colin, what's his name in the, against Mr. J uh, Nixon, sorry, Colin. Oh, Tim Hoven. Tim Hoven. Hoven. Yeah, Tim Hoven. So I, I asked him that question the other day. I was like, sir, I was like, I have an 18 month daughter. The masks mandate are lifted. She cannot get vaccinated. How, as a society, are we supposed to protect the ones that are unvaccinated? And you know, the ones that are immunocompromised, it was like, well, you're a mother, it's up to you to make good decisions. Um, this yeah. is not how public health works, by the way. Um, we, we should just take a moment here and mention that this is airing Wednesday, the 23rd, the UCP nomination meeting for Rocky Mountain Sundry uh insert the entire name here I, I forget it off the top of my head i had it pulled up a few minutes ago because i was just checking when it was is mm -hmm. wednesday night so when this is airing tim hoven and jason nixon are going against each other in a no, uh, hoven has been disqualified has he because if you check the ucp uh, website the it's uh still the, there? it's still there so and the alberta elections website still says he's there so I, I understand that people have been saying he's being uh, turfed from the uh, disqualified, as you said, yeah. but he is still on the website on the uh, notice of aid, uh, notice of nomination meeting. And maybe it's just an oversight from the communications people, but I can imagine that the UCP are very much on top of those type of things. That's interesting because last so Nate Pike and I did a live episode on lunchtime on uh, last Wednesday after the by-election. Yeah. And Mr. Hoven chimed in. So I was like, I'm going to poke a little bit to see you know, what he's up to and what the guy's about. 
Uh, and he was saying that he had to get back to work because he, you know, he not neglected his business, but he was so busy campaigning that, you know, he was busy with work now. So let's see what happens. Um, and I, was okay. I, I, I heard the same thing. And then after that, I heard that I, I went to the website because I wanted to know what was coming up because I know there are a few nomination meetings in here and with the leadership uh, election, so a uh, leadership uh, review so close, I thought, okay, is this going to be a telling sign? First Kent, uh, first Gene, then Hoven. And then people are saying, no, Hoven's disqualified. So I don't know. <laughs> I and, don't know what to think anymore. <laughs> There's no consistency in the due process. It's all over the map. It's so here's what I have to say about that how a nomination contest is managed shows the, uh, the strength or the fragil fragil fragility, fragility of the leader, fragility of the elixir in French, or how fragile a leader can be. That is an excellent example of what's happening right now. Because I, I would assume you would want that, that notice to be taken off the website yeah. if and just a notice of acclamation, but here we are. But it's uh, interesting because I'm just gonna make a little note. Last night he did a speech in front of community and he said that there's some, you know, people trying to topple the government of power and using extremely strong worded statements. I don't think that Jason seemed that great. He sounds think- pretty different. <clears throat> he sounds very what's the word here insecure that's the word insecure so i'm just so as of recording this monday night at eight o'clock this is airing wednesday but monday night at eight o'clock i'm just checking the event page of the ucp website the united conservative.ca and as of 8 29 of when we're recording this the application to deadline to become the UCP candidate in the constituency of Rimby, Rocky Mountain House, Sundry has passed. The following two contestants have submitted the applications, Tim Hoven and Jason Nixon. The events are, there are three uh, ballot boxes that are happening. So it still says there's a nomination meeting throughout the day. So we will be very, uh, it'll be very, <laughs> someone tweet, someone tweet Tim Hoven right now. <laughs> As we're recording this and ask them. I know we're not live, but it is an interesting, interesting moment. It's going to be extremely interesting to see what happens. Um, um. Exactly. But we have to take a quick break because yeah. we have advertisers and we want to make sure we get paid so their message gets out. So we'll be right back after a quick message from our advertisers and we'll be right back to talk about the other parties. While we've talked about the, the UCP for 20 minutes, let's talk about the other parties and where they stand going into the next year. Talk to you soon. Come celebrate Calgary's favorite cocktail. Calgary Caesar Fest is taking place on May 19th and 20th right here in the birthplace of Canada's official national cocktail. As listeners and viewers of the cross-border interviews with Chris Brown, you will receive 20% off your tickets when you use the promo code CBI Caesars. That's C-B-I Caesars, all one word. Just visit calgaryceasarfest.com and get your tickets today. Welcome back. Uh, as the commercial said, head over to Eventbrite. Get your tickets for the upcoming YY Caesar Fest here in the city of Calgary. It's sure to be a great time because as Calgary is, we are, as, as people know, Calgary is the home of the Caesar cocktail. So get your tickets because it will be one of a well, one great night, a uh, long weekend in May. Be sure to get your tickets today and use, use your special promo code as the commercial said. Uh, so we've talked about the UCP. We, uh, during the commercial break, we talked and we were trying to figure out if the actual, uh, Tim Hoven thing was, uh, found, uh, he's still up there. We'll see what happens Wednesday night. If he's, uh, still a candidate or not. 
But let's talk about the official opposition, and that is the Alberta NDP. Rachel Notley is coming off of a not surprising election loss in uh, Fort McMurray, uh, Lac La Biche. What is your thoughts on the the last week that has been post-election and lead up to this uh, leadership review for the NDP? Are they doing what they need to be doing? Are they dropping the ball some places? What do you think no, is going on they, in the NDP world? They changed their messaging and an awful lot of people noticed for the past week they have Miss Nutley has been more assertive. So she's speaking in means of if I'm elected, if we um, end up in government again, though, and she is coming up with concrete promises and concrete plans. Um, they have been working extremely hard, I would say, around that messaging and really tried to um, stop the constant attacks and really come up with solution. So I would say that's been quite the change since last week, I would say. Um, but I think that they landed what, right where they were expecting to land. Um, I remember last week people were saying, oh, well, the Wild Rose Independence probably took some votes from the NDP. That, that's not a thing. Like, <laughs> we need to give her a shake a little bit. Why would libertarians, right-wingers, would not be... Why would the why would like socialist NDPers go to uh, the Wild Rose Independence? And who knows how? And I I'm ninety percent sure I I said that, so I think that was a little dig at me there, Sarah. No, it's not you. No, it was Sue. Um, but no, it's not a thing. It's it just uh, prevented Mr. Gene of winning by seventy nine percent instead of sixty six. Yeah, Mr. G is extremely popular. So you know, with that by election, with the anti Kenny sentiment, with that election, was it an uphill battle for the NDP to begin with? Like they must have known going into it, there is like a small chance we could pick up the seat because we saw in 2015 there was a lot of seats picked up early for the NDP. There yeah, could be a chance. But with the current political climates. I would hope that the NDP is intelligent enough. And I think they knew they were them the water as soon as they walked into that race. If I would have been the NDP, I would have called all of the other party leaders and being like, let's not run a candidate as a show of protest towards Mr. Kenny. That's what I would have done. Um, they and decided, because some, sometimes, you know, when it, um, leader wants to get elected, the other parties are deciding they're not going to run a candidate because they want the new leader of the opposition to have a seat. Um, maybe perhaps they could have done that, but they chose to not to and run a candidate, which is fine. It's democracy. But so in, I think instead they, of the 18% that the NDP got, they would have gotten 20% if you add up no. all the opposition. No. Yeah. No. Yeah. So I think that's what I would have done, you know, really, if they wanted to step it up to the plate, be like, you know what, we're in extreme disagreement with this premier. We are extremely unhappy. We will, by choice, not present any competition in the next election and just let Mr. Jean gain access to the legislature. Okay. I see what you mean. I, I see what you mean. Because it, it, I, some, it, I said this a little bit on uh, election night, but the NDP kind of probably were hoping Gene got in because this gave some more cannon fodder for the right to self implode in some sense, right? Yeah, they're eating their own right now. They, they definitely are. Um, the thing is that the NDP wants Mr. Kent. It would be easier to go into an election with Mr. Kenny and then Mr. Gene. New leader, someone uh, who's been out of politics, someone who wasn't around during the COVID issue. So therefore, Gene's hands and, are clean. And we, well, but we know what his stance is on COVID um, decisions and whatnot. Um, you know, I, I still believe that, you know, even if we had a UCP government, this current leader could have been way worse um, given the circumstances. But at the end of the day, 
it's nothing changes for the NDP. They just need to move on, take the loss, which they did. Eighteen um, percent is not that bad when you're in hyper conservative party. Oh, if we want to, you know, really give them a little bit of a kudos here. I don't think they did that bad. They got the message in, I think. Um, but they did not deploy full full resources up there either, right? So we need to keep that in mind too. Um, we, I don't believe that we've seen uh, the full force in the, of the NDP in the last by election. Plus, at the same time, with their fundraising numbers in the last two years, they they are their war chest heading into twenty twenty three is going to be significantly uh, better uh, prepared yeah. than. I think even in the 2019, 2015 elections, this will be the first time that the party might actually be able to run a full out campaign. Because in 2015, we saw they were strategic where they were putting their resources. 2019, they were strategic as well to try and keep the resources. But this time, they might be able to run a full campaign. Do you think that benefits the candidates that are traditionally in those rural conservative seats? It will. Well, will it benefit them? Sorry, no. Um, if the NDP takes smart approaches to agriculture, um, try to understand um, really what the rural issues are these days, um, we're going to be dealing well right now. We have CP Rail and it's kind of out of the picture. So it's going to get uh, getting grain to market is going to get a little bit more difficult. Um, oil getting to market is going to be difficult as well because we're still relying on, um, you know, crude by rail. Um, I think that if, if the NDP take the proper measures and proper calculation, make proper calculation, I think that in some rural, um, would have a chance. Look at um, Danielle Larrivé and announced that she was nominated. She was elected last, you know, she she was elected in MLA. I strongly believe that with the right political climate, which I think we are right now, the NDP could have a shot in rural, definitely. Even with, with the go, go ahead. With the proper messaging. Well, in O'Neill uh, Carlier, the former Minister of Agriculture in the NDP, I also announced his uh, 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 run for the nomination. He was acclaimed. Daniel Larvey, like they were acclaimed back to back uh, on the weekend. I think it was uh, uh, March 13th and 12th. Um, we all remember Bill 6, though, the agriculture bill that really upset a lot of the rural farmers. Is that issue, could that issue rear its head? And does the NDP need to have a strong message going into the next election? Uh, what What they did and why they did it? I think they're going to have to explain, do a little bit of explaining on why they did Bill 6. Um, Some agree, some will say it's the greatest bill ever. Some will say it's the worst bill ever. Can we find a compromise somewhere in the middle that works for the farmers and the workers and the government? I strongly believe we can find a happy medium across the board. But I think that there's a lot of listening to do for the NDP. Um, and take that in and really build policy that will be resonated. Like if I was them, I would do a more original approach to issues, um, kind of, you know, micro campaigns across the province and really um, with different MLA, uh, potential MLAs and, you know, um, their candidates and really try to do micro campaigns across the province. Um, it could work. It could work. I've seen micro campaigns work in a regional approach. Yeah. So I think that would be my approach. By the way, if the EUCP sees that and hears that and does that, uh, my fee is going to be $15,000 and I'm going to be sending them a bill. But, you know, it's, you just got to be. No, understandable, but I want to, because I'm just cautious of time here, but I yeah. wanted to, I want to talk about the other parties in the race here, and that is the Alberta party, the Liberal party, the Green party, and we'll start with the big one, though, and that is the Wild Rose, the? It, the Wild Rose Independence Party. Yeah. Paul Hinman uh, put all the chips on the table, all on black for Fort McMurray, Lac Labiche, 
It came up yeah. red. Actually, it came up double zero. He, his uh, former colleague, Brian Jean, is uh, back in the legislature. Probably not the most happiest thing for Paul Hinman. But does the Wild Rose, what does the Wild Rose Independence Party need to do now? Are they up creek without a paddle now? Are they trying to recoup and try to figure out what they have yeah. to do to win? Or because this was their shot. This was, I think, their shot to win. And I just think they... Like, what it, they ran removed against, the football. <laughs> yeah, well, they ran against Mr. Jean. That was their first issue. They do not have any representation in the legislature right now. That's their second issue. Um, and they don't have the electoral base across the province to support them. Fourth issue. Um, you know, yes, they had a strong show up north. They could have a, a strong show. So what I'm expecting is that actually the WIPA could be splitting the vote in rural, helping the NDP to take over a few ridings. Um, in the South, we need to remember that 60% of the electorate would like to see Mr. G uh, Mr. Kenny gone. So they don't approve of his leadership. They have lost trust and whatnot. So, you know, when you're... You don't like the UCP, you don't think you think they're too left for you. The WIPA is a good option. So I think we could see kind of a wild rose slash PC situation again, where in rural, where the most conservative people are, um, maybe it could help the is, NDP get, getting more ground. It could. As much as I don't like going back to Jason Kenny on every single subject, it seems like he's the elephant um, in the room and we have to yes. talk about him. He he created this ball. Well, he didn't he didn't create this party, but Brian Jean and him created the United Conservative Party. Is yeah. it a knock against him that the conservative movement is fractured by so many pop-up parties with the Alberta Statehood Party, the Alberta Advantage Party, the Independence Party of Alberta, the Wild Rose Independence Party. Is this a knock on him to say, because I don't remember these parties running in the 2019 election and they have all come out in full force in the 2020, well, two, whatever we want to call this. This year. all comes out from anti-vaccine and time and days. Is that what it is? I think it has to do with it. Mr. Hoven, when we were talking about vaccines and all that, he was mentioning pro-vaxxers. I was like, oh, interesting. Um, I think it's the extremely right that we're like, no, you know what, guys? Your guys are not conservative enough for us. Like, we need to find a new home. But how much more conservative can you be? That is the question. But even I would argue that Mr. Kenny style right now is not necessarily conservatism, like we're used with the PCs in Allison Redford or, you know, Brian Mulroney back in Ottawa. Um, it's more of a populism kind of American style politics that we're seeing right now. Um, it's not pure conservatism. Um, and a lot of people have their own opinions about that on where in the spectrum Mr. Kenny should be sitting. But it's a anti Kenny, anti restrictions, anti, uh, anti uh, increase and in anti Trudeau, in anti Trudeau convoy. You know, name it. There's always a little home for someone somewhere. Um, but I, if Mr. Kenny's not careful, he could put a dent. They could put a dent into a few of his writings. We have two last parties I want to just briefly mention mm -hmm. here, and they failed to gain any significant support, uh, the Alberta Party and the Liberal Party. The Liberal Party actually ran a candidate, surprise, surprise. I, I, I Barry Morishita, the Alberta Party leader, has been on the show a few times, and uh, he ran. they ran a candidate up there. This is the first time for him. Uh, running as the leader of a party in an election, by-election somewhat. He didn't run. Another candidate did. Um, are these parties, is this something to look into? Uh, these parties doing so badly at the polls with barely getting 2% each? The Alberta party will, um, the Alberta liberals will, Alberta liberal, they will always get 2.5, 3%. 
um, and we're not expecting them a better show to do a better showing. The Alberta party, what I, a by-election is not always the right time to, if you really want to have a good pulse of what is happening, it's not the time to test new strategies. Well, that's my two cents as a strategist. You know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have done it that way. I think that the Alberta party, if they want to survive, need to pick four or five ridings where they would be able to focus all of their resources in and be, get busy to winning those four or five ridings. And that's it. You forget the rest of the slate. You forget a full slate. You get those people elected and get them in the legislature. Then we can talk about running more candidates. But until they get a candidate back, well, it goes, it goes back to the Greg Clark, right? Because the Alberta party were in the wilderness until 2015 when Greg Clark became, uh, was sort of launched onto the scene because what the Alberta party did, if you remember that campaign, because I remember it quite well, they focused that into Calgary elbow like there was no tomorrow. Yeah. And, and they picked it up and the Alberta party gained two floor crossers with an NDP, with a PC. And... I could see that happening. Maybe the Alberta party wants to run a full slate. I've asked them if they're going to. They're going to try, but they need, they need to focus. They need more Greg Clark out there. They need extremely, extremely strong candidates. We've been noticing too, just to, so for the next election, you need to have a really, really strong slate. So very often we vote because we like the guy or we vote because nominate this person because, well, she did her time. And this election for the province is extremely important. So it is in the best interest of all parties to take their nomination and uh, candidate recruitment extremely seriously. Because let's say if I was the NDP, um, they need to win a lot in Calgary. So you need leaders, strong leaders, outspoken leaders, people that can deliver a win. Not solely, well, it's gonna sound like I'm taking a stab here, but so we have, um, I'm in Calgary, Glenmore, we have, there's two candidates. One candidate is more community oriented. Um, one is more leadership oriented. One is more leadership oriented, she has, transition energy, renewable energy um, experience. And we all know that this is the future and that that the, what she does for work and her language would be resonating a little bit more with a very conservative writing against an associate minister. So I think that we really need, people need to have a good look at who's running for nomination they're writing and start to being put on the, your strategy hat and think, do I, am I voting because she's my friend or am I voting for this person because he, she, they, them could deliver the win for my party. I think that the parties will have to get around that. And the Alberta party, if they don't win the next round, they're, how much longer can they hang on? And that is my question. You know. Ask the liberals in the eighties in this province. You know, they had Nick Taylor. Nick Taylor, unfortunately, passed last year. Was it last year? I believe it was. Yeah, yeah. early Um, Yeah, so, you know, the, the Alberta Liberals, they have been with a leader for two years. People were voting for David Swan. They were not voting liberal. Um, so there's not much left for them either. I think it's time to, it's important to have representation, but at what cost? If you're going to be the butt of the joke at every election and you're really not showing any strategies or not willingness to change, I'm sorry. I'm, people are starting to run out of pity for the parties that are not trying to show any changes. Um, we have to take a quick break for our second advertiser because we want to make sure we get paid. Uh, we will be back. Um, we might be focusing a little bit differently than 2023 Alberta politics. 
Uh, recent news out of Ottawa on Monday, we might just digest a little what's happening there and what this means for a few of the leadership races. So we'll be right back after this quick uh, commercial break, everyone. Horror fans unite. The cross-border interviews with Chris Brown is pleased to offer a free audible copy of David Mercer's newest book, Living Death, A Love Story. The book is about Nick, who having suffered the horrible loss of his wife, plays the hero and rescues Jenny from her abusive boyfriend. Deciding that he has one last adventure in him, he invites her on a cross-country road trip. Little did they know that the world, as they knew it, was ending. Visit crossborderinterviews.ca to enter into the draw. Simply tell us your favorite horror film by April 14th and be entered. Welcome back. Thanks for another great commercial break where if you want to head over to the crossborderinterviews.ca, hit the book giveaway and you can be entered into uh, receive a copy of Living Death, the audible copy of David Mercer's new book. Um, so we've talked about the road to 2023, but I guess we should rename this now because I know we're talking about a word of politics in the first uh, 40 minutes, but this is the road to kind of 2025 now, because as of the Monday night, uh, CBC has reported and yet again, I, we have not verified this, but we are assuming this is true because everyone is up in arms about it. Um, yeah. The Liberals and the uh, the NDP have a, a tentative deal that is currently in front of the NDP MPs that will see the NDP uh, prop up the Liberals until 2025 by voting on supply management and uh, confidence votes. In return, the NDP would Ooh. get dental care and pharmacare. Um, so... <laughs> How, how, how are you feeling about this, Sarah? What's, what's your, what, I'm assuming you, you saw this as well and you're probably a little bit shocked that this came out on a Monday night. No, no, no. Well, I've worked on how many campaigns now? 30? Yeah. Five leaderships given, yeah, around that. Um, how could I say? I'm not surprised at all because the country could not. So here's the thing. Everybody was at up in arms when the liberals called a, an election during a pandemic. They went in with a minority government and they want to make sure that they can consolidate power because they could spin it in the way that we heard what the Canadian population has said. They are sick of election. For the sake of the country, let's unify and provide and bring some stability. Mm. They could do that. That's how I would spin it for the good of the country. So, so you're not shocked about it? No, I'm not. I'm not. I, there was always rumors here and there, once in a while, where you know, will they, you know, create an alliance? Will they, you know, have an agreement? In this. I'm not surprised at all. It's it's like, let's say, do you remember that vote back in 2005? When Harper. did Bill and Dustin cross the floor? 05. Okay, yeah. Yeah. After that, it was a confidence vote, right? To topple Mr. Martin. So you had the liberals that were a minor minority government. Then you had the conservatives, the bloc, the green. The and no, there was no green at that time. No. May was not there? May didn't join the forces in 2000, until 20, 2008. Oh, thank you. Sorry. My bad. Anyhow, so see, that's how I pay that's, attention. That's, that's, my, that's my green party trivia for tonight, guys. <laughs> thank you. So, they created an alliance to defeat the government. And then the stability of the government was depending on one guy, John Cadman. Well, isn't it Chuck? Chuck, Chuck Cadman? Chuck Cadman, yes. So Mr. Cadman was extremely sick in terminal phase of his illness, almost in palliative care at that point. 
they flew him back to Ottawa. And I remember sitting in the commons with a few conservative and watching the vote, like literally watching, waiting to see. And Mr. Canman stood up to support the liberals. He was the last vote. Everything was on his shoulders. And I remember that all the parties were just trying to court him to really like, no, oh, vote for, you know, vote with us. We're going to make it good. And, and not a long time after that, Mr. Camden passed. Um, fortunately, I, I still remember that time. Um, but I remember that, you know, the NDP, the conservative, there's always alliances somewhere when someone gets something, wants something. And right now, I believe with everything that we've seen, so here's my take. Trudeau's tired of convoys. Trudeau's tired of conservative cheap points. Trudeau's tired of hearing inflation, rhetoric, blah, blah, blah. but he can't increase the, you know, the, the base rate with Bank of Canada because now we're going to be paying more. Yes, but how do you get rid of inflation? There's a few measures that need to be done. Um, we've seen a lot of conservative candidates um, leadership candidates, you know, barking, but not bringing a whole lot of solutions. We even saw Miss um, Bergen the other day saying, well, maybe we should protect the skies in the Ukraine, which is not a good message. Um, when President Zelensky uh, spoke to the House of Commons, she did not applaud. I think Mr. Trudeau and Mr. Singh just really got, that's going to sound rude, but he got tired of their petty crap. And it just decided to lock it in for the next three years. Because let's remember, the NDP cannot afford to go back to the election anytime soon. I don't think they could afford I don't think they could afford it that last election that they ran in, but they seem to have they somehow. Because <laughs> I remember when was the last election? Uh, a couple of elections ago, they had to take a loan on the Leighton building to be able to pay for their expenses. Two like, that 2019 election. Or was it 15? Was it 15? Might have been Maybe. 15. Anyway. <laughs> anyway, doesn't matter. I think it was with loan care. Oh, yeah, you're right. It, is, it was 2015, I think. So, you Ooh. know, I think stability will help. And also by doing that, they're going to anger all of the conservative pro premiers in this, in, in this country. Which every single one of them, which they don't care. No, they really don't at this point. They're tired of it. The this gives Trudeau another three years. Now there was speculation, whether it be true or not true, uh, that Trudeau this was this was his last term because it was another minority situation. He might step down. Now that they're locked in till twenty, potentially locked into 20, 2025, um does this give him some leeway and some runtime to potentially see his see if his poll numbers do inc uh, increase? He's going to be fifty three by then. Basically, when his father started in politics, it seemed like. <laughs> oh God, he remembers his father's funeral. Um, so his youngest is going to be. His youngest was two, I believe, when he got elected for the first time in 2015. His youngest is going to be 12. His kids are growing 15, 16 years old now or something, 14. Um, uh, depends on what Sophie wants to do as well, I think. Um, you know, eight years is not a bad reign. Eight years is pretty good. Uh, no, 2025. Sorry, 10 years. I can't math today. It's like I keep having the 2023 election in my head. I think that he's going to try to position Ms. Freeland the best way he can. And, and that's why we're seeing her as a deputy uh, prime minister right now is that he's trying to make sure that she has all of the tools and that her voice is heard. He's really empowering a few cabinet members right now, really trying to build up his succession. That's kind of what I see it as which uh, we can compare with, you know, Mr. Harper back in 2015, there was no legacy, there was no succession plan. Hence it why was we just had like, Andrew Shear and Aaron O'Toole. Yeah. I want to talk about 
the leadership and what this means for the leadership of the conservative party race we had one candidate coming out and saying we're going to run i'm running as the uh uh prime minister of canada pierre paul Levere was very strongly uh he's strongly favored to potentially win this well whether you agree with it or not he is quote unquote the semi front runner um what does this do for the conservative movement does this let the conservative voters think to themselves who do we want in the leaders of the leader of the official opposition seat for three years? <laughs> um, Pierre Polyev needs to change his slogan though, because really, it's, 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 you're, buddy, you're going to be running to be the leader of the opposition. Um, I really wish that the conservatives would make the smart choice and not just go for theatrics and bite words right now. And I strongly believe that Mr. Podiev could be disadvantaged with a very fast burn rate. He is gun blazing, attacking everyone. People will get sick of this in two, three months. And what's gonna happen is that the conservatives are more susceptible of winning the women's vote, of winning, you know, New Brunswick, all of the Maritimes, Quebec, Ontario, 905. The 905 is extremely important. I don't think Mr. Podiev can win the 905. We need to be honest here. Um, there's also something that, you know, uh, I was talking to a few people today and it's like, oh yeah, we're going to be increasing our base. Yeah, but friend, increasing your base in Alberta doesn't make you a bigger party or doesn't bring more MPs in the house for you. And I think there's a lot of people who are trying, but I think what's interesting is that Mrs. Rempel Garner is now the national chair campaign for Patrick Brown, which is considered more like a, a red Tory. I think it's a power move from her and a lot of people will be following. I was surprised and not surprised by a decision because I think she is tired because she has been extremely quiet for a long time now. And I believe that she is tired of that kind of tirade, kind of theatrics, dramatic politics. And she really just want to get back to work. Um, well, well, her tweets and her editorials over the last few months have been very curated, cur curated, but also very if you read in between the lines, and I know you should never assume what people are thinking, but it's been very much anti polyvare if you ask me. Like, we don't believe this hype that the WEF is trying to reset. We need to change how we vote. We might need to look at a regional base because if we continue down the path we're going, we're never going to get back into power. It's yeah, so here's an interesting thing. I was looking at studies this week and the more anti-vaxxer you are, the more you believe the WEF is part of a huge conspiracy theory for global globalism, great reset, name it, whatever you want. And they are uh, pro-Russia. And we need to remember that Ms. Garner's roots are not Russian. She is from Ukrainian descent, if I'm not mistaken. So there's also, so here's the thing. If Poniev wins, they're going to keep the people that would most likely be going to the NP, uh, the CPP if Mr. Share would win. So those people in anti-vaxxers, my freedoms, I want to smile again. Smiles are legalized, you know, that rhetoric that we're all tired to listen to already. Um, and she's moving towards a more measured candidate with a serious platform and a serious plan, which is, you know, I think it's good. I think it's good for the party. Last question before we start to wrap up, because we're almost at the hour mark, and I just want to make sure that mm -hmm. I don't keep you more than I have to. Okay. There are eight candidates in this race. I know we were talking about what the uh, coalition meant, but I've got to get your take on this. This party is not united at all, is it? It is very fractured. Like when you have someone like Mark Dalton, 
running for the leadership of the Conservative Party of Canada. You have someone like Scott Atkinson, or Addison, sorry. Um, you, you have someone like Joseph Bernot, who I don't know, but he is running. He's a Saskatchewan business owner. What is going on with the Conservative Party right now? Is it fractured to no extent, or is it just people are seeing that usually 10 years uh, for a government is a long is a long term and they start looking mm -hmm. and people just assume that if i become leader of the official opposition i'm going to be prime minister in the next election so i think that there's a lot we need to recognize that mr harper was extremely good at whipping his caucus and keeping his caucus in line um what sometimes i like to say just to irritate a few people is that was the conservative party was destined to survive after Mr. Harper's departure? Maybe not. Stephen Harper Mr. was the Conservative Party. What I strongly, Mr. Harper had a way to rein in his MPs and not giving them the leeway like on the abortion issues and such and such on the pro-life, more right-wing agenda. Um, and since Mr. Harper has left, there's that resurgence of more Christian, Catholic, my rights, anti-vaxxers, uh, pro-life, um, anti-feminist kind of movement happening. Um, and I strongly believe that the party is extremely divided. But here's the thing. If Mr. Podiev wins, there's a lot of old PCs that could be leaving. If Mr. Charest wins, there's a risk of less conservative MPs leaving because he's reasonable. It's not his way or the highway. He does take the time to listen and will be able to bring back consensus to the table. That is not an endorsement. It is just a observation. Mr. Charest has much, much more experience than Mr. Poiliev, I would say at least 20 years more, if not a little bit more. Um, so we shall see, but I do believe that if Mr. Poitier wins, more conservatives will be leaving, especially 905 Ontario. And it Get will back. solidify that liberal vote in those urban centers like Toronto, Vancouver, uh, Montreal, Montreal, even Calgary. You might see Calgary Skyview. You might see Edmonton still. Maybe not Calgary Skyview. Don't get me wrong. Uh, the liberals up in Skyview have a little bit of an issue right now. So yeah. it could go another way, but I don't see a path to entering those uh, urban centers that uh, a candidate like Patrick Brown or John Charest or even Scott Addison, he, that could yeah. potentially enter that. And that's just my take. For those who are wondering, yes, I do have two John Charest signs behind me, but let's be honest, I do have a Pierre Trudeau sign, uh, 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 autograph as well and Ken Dryden autograph. So come at me if you think I'm a John Charest fan. <laughs> that, that's just my, but hey, if Sean, John Charest wants to come on the show, happy to have him. Um, we'll send him an email. There you go. Um, Sarah, thank you for doing this. I know uh, we were supposed to just talk about the 2023 election, but you know, that's what happens. We talk about the 2023 election and then Trudeau decides he wants to do something. We have to talk about that for five minutes. Sometimes, uh, you know, Education is the best way. Exactly. Exactly. I see it as education session to really try to break down the issues and bring some rationale and to the madness. That's, Which that's we funny. highly don't have in this, oh, this world anymore of uh, actually rational thinkers. So hopefully someone out there is listening. We're losing it more and more. That's true. Yeah. But anyway, Sarah, thank you so much for doing this. This has been an honor and a pleasure as always. Uh, we might have you back on probably to talk about some other issue like leadership review, possibly. Um, I'm sure it's going to come up. Exactly. It's in politics. Nothing ever happens, right? Uh, for everyone here at the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown, have yourself an excellent rest of your day. Remember, guys, just get out from behind that social media for 10 minutes and have a conversation with somebody. It actually does help our society and it does create a better democracy. So with that, have yourself an excellent day and talk to you later, guys. Mm -hmm.